So Will, if you haven't met him, is awesome. Uh, Will is definitely a disruptor. Like he really, really gets a kick around taking things and shaking them up. So he's pretty proud of the fact that he um, skipped uni. He went straight to teaching uni courses. Um, five years ago, Will start or co-founded um, Squareweave, which is sort of a digital development agency. Uh, they do awesome work, and they decided about a year ago, nine months, year, yeah, no. that they wanted to start working for companies that they were really proud to be part of, and sort of social good organizations. So they set a target of what percent? At least a third. At least a third of their revenue to come from sort of social good organizations uh, after a year. And they've hit that nine months in, which is pretty awesome. So they've worked with companies like Headspace um, and other just awesome not-for-profits. One of the things they also did along the way, um, besides for starting four different startups out of it, was Clarity, which is what Will's going to talk about tonight. So let's give Will an awesome round of applause. Oh, <laughs> that was very kind. You make me sound a lot taller than I actually am. Well done. Um, yeah, Squirrelly, we're a tech company, um, which means that I'm a massive geek. Um, yeah, we've been around for about five years, and um, we run like a startup. So uh, we birth companies at a rate of knots. Um, these companies go profitable within a week sometimes, um, and then leap brands and name changes and all kinds of things. So we're, we're, we're used to breaking things really, really fast. Um, I'm going to talk about breaking things as a startup really, really fast. I'm also going to talk about this thing called Clarity. Now, um, Clarity actually started in this building um, about nine months ago, about this time we decided to become the social good tech company. Um, it was at a hackathon, one of these like you've got 24 hours to build a sustainable business and launch it and get customers. And I was like, well, I've already done that a bunch of times and making money is actually kind of easy. Giving it away is really, really hard. So why don't we start a sustainable charity in 24 hours? And uh, we pivoted our brand like three or four times um, since. We've learned a butt ton about how the charity world works. Um, and what I'd like to talk to you about tonight is what happens when you get startup people who like to break things really, really fast and fling them up against the charity world, which operates on a different scale. Let's put it that way. But um, maybe, maybe I can get a little, like, a uh, little bit of tech understanding. Um, sorry, this is really high school. Put your hand up if you've heard of Google. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, keep it up if you've uh, have you ever read Reddit. Okay, cool. This is good. Um, keep your hand up if you've ever read Hacker News. Cool. Wow, I'm really impressed. That's really good. Keep your hand up if you've um, ever met Paul Graham. <laughs> Neither have I, but I'd like to. Anyway, so, okay, cool. That gives me an understanding of where you are technically. Um, I'd like to talk about tax. Um, when I talk to people about startups, um, I like to explain it like a bunch of kids that are snorting Ritalin building tanks. This is kind of how it works. We build stuff really, really quick, and then we fling it at things and we break them. Um, we kind of did this to the music industry a little while ago, you might have noticed. And I have the distinct impression that the same thing is about to happen to the charity world. Um, For those of you who haven't experienced this idea before, this is uh, Lean. Uh, Lean is a development or, or like get things done methodology that lets you really quickly figure out what a problem is and solve it. And this is kind of how we run everything at my day job, from lunch, like how we get lunch every day, through to how we deliver projects, to how we manage our finances. Um, I mean, we're, a, we're like a 12-person company with no project managers and no defined bosses. It sounds like kids on ADHD <laughs> building tanks in a, in a schoolyard, right? The idea of this, this lean thing, and, and apologies if you already know this, because it means you're very, very clever already, is that if ever you want to figure something out, you just make a bunch of assumptions, the build bit, you build something, put it out into the wild, and learn a bunch of stuff. You do that by measuring things. And from that, you learn stuff. And then you 
launch your way through this uh, iterative process as fast as you possibly can. It's way, way different to having a mission and a vision and going out and doing a bunch of stuff and then finding out five years later if it's worked or not. It's about having data at the very, very core of the company. So for instance, Clarity, I can tell you exactly how many hours were spent on it, how much of that time was spent buggering around with banks. A lot of it. How much of that was spent on actual development? How much was talking to charities? How much was project management? To, to the nth degree, I can tell you exactly how many lines of code. Um, this kind of iterative approach is something that I haven't seen that much in the charity world. So I'd like to explore how we did this um, with Clarity. We decided to look at the, Clar the, uh, the charity world. And it seems to involve people giving money to charities. That's correct, yeah? <laughs> I got that right? Okay, so people give money to charities. Generally, they give it in the post, or they've got checks, or they uh, do it online if they're really, really clever. And the charities go and do stuff with the money, and everyone's happy, yay. Um, when a lean company looks at this idea, we're like, okay, cool. Can we break this? Can we make it faster? Can we do it differently? Um, we did the measure thing. We went and gave a bunch of money to a bunch of charities and measured how long it physically took us. Four or five minutes for the average website. So we built a thing that took 20 seconds to do it. You click Facebook login, you click, you put in your credit card details and it's done. Um, so we fixed, well, we dealt with this problem as quickly as we could. It took about 20 hours of development time to build the entire platform that did this, really, really quick. Um, and then we looked at the feedback mechanism. So generally any system, any like web system has a feedback mechanism, right? So you give a bunch of money to a charity and then they say, well done, you did it. Congratulations. We decided we would measure the kind of baseline for this in our stupid let's build a tank and shoot stuff way by making a fake person. Um, Joe, Joe Clarity. Um, Joe is 23 year old girl and she's from Melbourne and she likes indie rock and she gave $2 to a whole bunch of charities online. Um, she put in her address details and she put in whatever stuff that they asked her for on the form. And this happened, this started maybe a month or two ago. And this happened. We spent maybe like 50 bucks on this experiment and it took, you know, a, a, a half a day or something, what it was. And we got this kind of thing. Now like, bless them, but a 23 year old girl doesn't read this. And we went and talked to media production companies and said like, how much would it actually cost to print a like eight page full color booklet. We found out that not only were we wasting our own money, we were wasting the money of um, a whole bunch of other people that had donated to that charity because it was coming back in that form um, from an online donation. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Bless them, they do fantastic work. So, and I, I'm gonna lose friends by doing this, but let's charge along to the next thing we wanna break. Um, the money thing. We looked at all of the other charities um, and we looked at the charity platforms and figured out how they did their money. There's like Everyday Hero and Online Giving and blah, blah, blah. There's all these kinds of different things. You can do it via PayPal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it doesn't get below 3% in credit card fees across the board pretty much ever. Um, the average is about seven. Americans are much better than Australians. And above and beyond, people clip the ticket when they are sending money from one place to the other. This is how PayPal works. This is how almost all of the online platforms work. They'll take their 3% for the credit cards. They'll take another 2% for admin. They'll put it through to the charity that goes and does stuff with it. So we broke that a bit by partnering with brands. Because we had built a very simple system that allowed us to do whatever we want with the data and money, um, we went and found this lovely company called Etico. And we said to them, why don't you just pay the 3% fee for us? And so every single time one of our users gets a little, hey, you're awesome, you just donated money to a charity, which means you're fantastic, lots of love. Uh, it's a receipt. Apparently, you need to do that legally if you take money from somebody. And Etico pays the fee. So for instance, for this 20 bucks, it was 60 cents. Um, we've just built a scalable targeted advertising platform. Um, we'll now be able to do this targeting specific demographics and user groups and all kinds of things. And you guys have heard of Facebook, right? Like they do this and it works when it goes to scale. So we've just built a money making platform on the back of a charity project whilst saving everybody the fee. Okay. Then we had to look at this feedback loop of evaluation because we realized that a lot of our users were like, I have no idea what these charities are and what they do and I have no idea whether I can trust them or not. People my age and below have real trouble trusting charities. Um, we have this stupid idea that fundraising and admin costs mean something. 
um, and that they somehow impact the charity's ability to do awesome stuff. Um, we see the snail mail marketing, we get stopped in the street by charity muggers, and there's a whole bunch of distrust with kids. So we found out that there's a whole bunch of evaluators like GiveWell and Big Bang and Malago, etc, 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 who are quite good at figuring out the charities that are kicking ass and delivering real impact. So if we, if we could um, ask people to give money to those charities based upon the understanding that there's a bunch of people that are very clever at this, um, we tracked the numbers and we found out that people were suddenly giving a lot more because they knew that the money was going to be used in really interesting ways. The other flip side of that is that the reason that these guys can be evaluated well is because they are data-driven organizations themselves. Now this is kind of an ugly thing to talk about because there are a lot of really brilliant not-for-profits out there who aren't able to give you back nice delicious figures on their impact. However, for the ones that can, we can do really cool stuff with the data. We also learned that as soon as we had created a relatively simple where we had a bunch of people giving a bunch of money to charities and people were evaluating and etc, etc, um, we can wrap circles around these people. We might have individual donors, we might have funds. Um, CSR, right, like corporate social responsibility, essentially a bunch of people that happen to be in a company together deciding to give company money to someone. Like at its, uh, remember we're, we're startup geeks, we like to systematize stuff. That's kind of the baseline for a system of CSR. Normally it's governed by the CEO or somebody um, powerful in the organization that's got strong ideas about how this stuff should work. We found out that all we had to do was draw a net around a few of our users and say, these guys all happen to work at company X. We can suddenly do bottom-up decision-making about how CSR practices should work. We can figure out exactly where geographically the money should go or to what particular causes, etc. Um, these kinds of ideas work. You've seen Yammer, you've seen our say. Um, this is really exciting from the CSR point of view. And finally, so I'm kind of, I'm, I'm drawing the map like a startup geek would approach this, right? We, we figure out a system and we try and break each individual bit and then we connect it all together. Um, in theory, all this results in impact um, because these people give money and they want to see impact happen. And you guys are all charitable people, right? You're in this scene, so you know how that works and you understand the signal flow. I had no freaking idea that this even existed nine months ago. I didn't know what impact was. I didn't even know that it was a word that charities cared about at all. And there is a groundswell of people my age and below that have no idea. We just consider that you give money to charities, they go and do stuff and they spend it all on cocaine fundraising or whatever it is. So by defining a complex system that can be used to generate impact, um, I get, it's kind of like LinkedIn, yeah? LinkedIn, you, you click accept on somebody's little um, accept request, you say that they're really good at web development and public speaking, and then you go about your day. And then in the back end, because LinkedIn has got this beast behind it, every portion of which is, is, is beautifully tuned to do something particular, uh, LinkedIn makes a freakish amount of money just selling the system and the data and the relationships. By creating a relationship in which you understand the mechanisms within it, you can create a system that generates value. So Clarity itself is not a not-for-profit. We expect to make money. Um, we've tracked exactly how much money we've spent in time and hours and dollars and everything, and we expect that we will not make money until we can prove that the impact we deliver is greater than the amount of money it costs us to do this, which is what some really clever charities are starting to do these days. Anyway, how does this actually look? I've talked a lot about theory and I haven't actually explained what's going on. And I've probably alienated a few people in the room by being such an aggressive startup geek. My apologies. If we consider <laughs> that not all charities are created equal, an ugly thing to say, but something that resonates with our audience like crazy. Kids love this idea. And that you can measure the impact of a project, the bang for buck. I mean, we do have really well-measured charities that can say, cool, we've got a 1 to 15 bang for buck ratio. Um, Kickstart, for instance. Um, they're a Malago funded. I believe they're on Big Bang Philanthropy, etc. Uh, it's like 330 bucks. Gets a family out of poverty forever. Nice meaty number that I can understand and I can back it up with data. To find out which these guys are, we ask the people that know best. It's another little like thing that we plug into the system. Um, we're actually looking at doing a clarity-based evaluation for charities in Melbourne that are really, really promising but can't access um, Bar Foundation or Big Bang or Malago or Jasmine because these are multi-million dollar funds. Um, 
we ask them, they tell us who to give to, we funnel money through to them, it all happens like this, and there's no buggering about, and everyone's happy and you go home. And the web geeks worry about web, the measurements worry about measurement, the money people worry about making a bunch of money, and we're all happy, in theory. Um, we're gonna be launching this in about a week. Oh, by the way, we've pivoted our brand like three times since we started. Um, it actually started as a dating platform. Um, the idea was that uh, if you go to a party and you find somebody with similar interests, you like them. If you go online to like a dating platform and you can only date people that give to the same charity as us you, it was somehow like sexy charity giving. We dropped that really quick <laughs> and pivoted towards this. But anyway, so this is the new pivot that we'll be launching in like a week. Um, where we can track exactly how much, where, and why the money is going. We've got cool little maps where we can draw lines of exactly where the money goes and where it comes out and all that kind of stuff, just because we've gathered the data in the right way. And we can do cool stuff like this, where we can say 65 helps one person out of poverty, 330 out forever. We can measure exactly how much each donation, the aggregate donation, the donations between friends and groups. Um, we can see that for me, for instance, I'm 28 years old and I live in Melbourne. So the average giving per month for people like me is... Oh, hello? I think I broke it. <laughs> I like to break things, apparently. How do I make it go? Hello? Technology. I like technicians. Technicians are good. Okay, so let me try again. 28 year old man in Melbourne, average giving for me, or oh, people like me, is 21 bucks a month. Um, if I was to live in Sydney, it would be very slightly more. If I was to live in the Northern Territory, it would be very slightly less. Um, we've got this nice little curve that we've figured out of giving over time. Um, my co-founder likes it to call it the I can't take it with me curve. And we can track exactly how much people give over time as they get older. And we can track if you start to give young, uh, give lots when you're young, and as you get older, the amount that you give scales up and the amount generally given to charity gets bigger and the impact you're driving gets bigger. We do it all because we've got the maths behind it, right? Um, let me show you what we've actually got live now um, because we're just playing around with a bunch of stuff right now. You can see, for instance, that I've just given $20 to Blue Dragon because they do really cool stuff over in Vietnam. Um, I've done 120 via this particular iteration of the platform and I've inspired 72 um, because we can track inspiration. Um, the, there's a lot hidden behind that tiny little number. If somebody gives and they say, well, I did this because Will inspired me to, that adds to my tiny little total. And over down the line, we'll be able to track giving inspiration for brands and for companies and in CSR departments. And you'll end up seeing, if we pivot that direction, in another six months, it will say 3,400 X dollars given by the 40 people that work for company X, inspired by Y. And that kind of data, when we give that to charities, that's the kind of data that's allow, going to allow you to do really, really, really impactful fundraising. It's not going to be these bits of paper flying around on the floor. It's going to be finding out who actually cares about you, why they engage with you, and who their friends are. We, we can do all that stuff because we've got the data. Um, but let me, let me charge ahead to the big picture. So um, we're really, really grassroots. Um, the, the Clarity platform is essentially my development company's CSR kind of give. Does that make any sense? Yeah? Because we, we did the maths and we figured out it's more efficient for us to create a platform that inspires other people to give than it is for us to just shut up and give our money to an impact charity. Um, I'm not drinking alcohol until I make $10,000 personally because I figured out that that's the tipping point for me to do this and not just shut up and give my personal wage to a really impactful charity. Um, but there is big money on the horizon. It's, it's very, very interesting. Just by doing this platform, I found out that there are funds and people and, and groups of philanthropists in Melbourne that are, are currently, right now, I had a meeting with a guy today, pulling together multi-million dollar funds specifically for data-driven, impact-driven charities. Um, just a little while ago, um, a charity called Watsi. Has anyone heard of Watsi? Okay, go look them up. Watsi is the first charity to make it onto Y Combinator. Y Combinator are 
probably the most respected venture capital firm in the entire world, and for the first time ever, they've brought a charity on board because this charity is data-driven. Uh, you can look at all of their bank accounts, you can look at their trending curves, you can look at every single transaction they've ever done online because they just give it all away for free. Um, W-A-T-S-I, look it up. And between our bottom-up pressure that we're providing and the top-down pressure that's going to be uh, driven by some of these larger funds that are coming around and people like the VC, WOTC style world, there is going to be a lot of money for charities in data-driven decision-making. So whilst I've kind of painted a big picture here, the important thing to take home is that all of the stuff that we did is not just for web geeks. Uh, the Lean methodology, there's books on it that I can recommend you, chat to me and I'll tell you what they are, that you can read in the weekend and then start applying these things to projects and things that you do every day. You can break stuff fast and quick in organisations and get really impactful data-driven results. It's not actually that hard. It's not, it's not just the reserve of web geeks, it's, it's something that all of us can do. And finally we're learning that the commercial world is catching up with this. Um, you'll see that there's, there's a lean group, the Build, Measure, Learn. There's a lean group in Melbourne and the last uh, meetup that they had, they had like 300 people at it, including CEOs and execs and, and very powerful people that are making really big decisions about where they put their money. So impact philanthropy is really not that far behind and our feeling is as soon as you guys get good at this, you guys are going to start really kicking ass when it comes to delivering impact. But... Uh, let me, let me finish, actually, with, with another little face. Now, uh, some of you know who Reddit is, that's good, and some of you know what Hacker News is, it's just great, and a couple of people know who Paul Graham is. Who knows who this guy is? Cool. Okay, for those of you who don't know, this is the guy that in... <laughs> uh, bollocks. Hello? Hi, oh my god, that works. Okay, this guy. This is Tim Berners-Lee. Um, hello? <laughs> he invented microphones. <laughs> He's an idiot. Uh, oh, okay. Great, I'm just gonna hold it like this. Tim Berners-Lee invented the internet. Well, he's one of the people that invented the internet, so you should probably go and bollocks. So, <laughs> Tim invented the internet, um, or he's one of the people that did invent the internet, and he recently came here to Melbourne and did a talk. Um, I found it particularly inspiring, because the one thing that he said, and he is right on the money with this, is that the future is going to be code. Like, the future is, is built in code. It's built by programmers, it's built with data-driven decisions. And what he said is, is really, really relevant to the charity world right now, because the simple fact is that if you don't know how to code, you better learn how to code in the next five, 10 years. And if you don't learn how to code, go and make friends with somebody that does, uh, because the future of the web and the future of impact giving and the future of philanthropy and almost everything else we do is gonna be really, really digital. So stop sending me snail mail. How do you measure impact um, horizontally? So how do you measure between um, certain ways of doing things? Um, AKA like you've got malaria netting versus deworming pills. They solve very different problems and they cost stuff. Um, the feeling at the moment within the, the, the techie impact driven world is that you just can't measure one against the other and it's a waste of everybody's time to try. Just the same way that measuring uh, the amount of Twitter followers versus the amount of Facebook followers uh, is a really dumb way of measuring uh, one against the other. You should measure each in its own way. So uh, what's actually happening now is uh, more around the idea of dealing vertically within each area. So uh, measuring, for instance, the problem of getting kids in India to school you could do that by deworming, you could do that by paying the parents to send their kids to school, you could do that by buying them um, uh, better uniforms. And so by measuring the impact vertically and getting good numbers on that, then maybe at some point in the future, because it's too hard a problem for me, we can worry about measuring impact horizontally. It's just too hard right now. But uh, just in the same way that mobile phones were too hard 10 years ago, and now we've got the, well, smartphones are too hard, and now we've fixed that problem. We'll do it lean, we'll deal with each problem as it comes. Any more questions? Are we just concentrating on charities or are we looking at CSR and corporate giving and all that stuff and the foundations, etc.? Um, yes and no. So one thing about startups is that generally we try and solve one problem really, really well. Um, and in our case, we're worrying about just 
are impact data and impact metrics and the, the giving cycle between individual donors and charities. So sure we'll be able to, and again we can, we can wrap a bunch of users in a group, call them a foundation and voila, you're doing foundational giving or company giving, etc, etc. Um, but one thing that we're a bit more excited about because we're tech geeks is, um, I don't know, forgetting about the idea that there is making a bunch of money and then there is not making a bunch of money and they're two ends of the spectrum. Um, so we're actually launching another project um, called Subservice, um, which is a subscription company, company creation. I'll try and say that again. It's kind of a meta company that makes subscription companies. So we're selling condoms by the month. Um, via the mail. 50% um, of profits from that go to Mothers to Mothers to solve HIV. Um, and they, they do really, really good impact driven work on that by helping mothers to not pass HIV onto their kids. So 50% of profits from people that buy condoms once a month via mail goes to that um, with like dog food and uh, the, the whole social enterprise thing. And in the same way that Clarity will probably never be a not for profit body, we plan to get good enough that we can take investment and make a butt ton of money whilst making the world better. Um, we're not so interested in the CSR company, big company, that kind of world, because we generally find that they can't move as fast as we can. Um, uh, as a company, Square Weave, we actually do the bulk of our work with entrepreneurs within banks and the Victorian government and some of these like really big mammoth, quite slow companies. And we generally find that the amount of work to pivot them just a little bit compared to the amount of work we could do uh, in a market that is, that's just right for the picking, like young people that like the internet, <laughs> um, it's a waste of our time to actually try and shift the behemoth. Um, but who knows what'll happen in two years from now. I think it's for us, it's more about delivering the greatest impact we can within the tiny little niche that we know about. How does a charity that isn't data-driven become more data-driven? <laughs> That's hard, to be perfectly honest. Um, we've, we've actually found that it's a lot easier for charities that are uh, quite new because they've built data they've built data and measurement right into the foundation of their, their work, um, have a much easier job of it. But we've found that for some of the larger companies, it's actually going and talking to Malago, GiveWell, Jasmine Social, etc. There are some smaller funds that are really good at helping deal with the impact problem. And we're actually finding that there is a lot of really clever data scientists around that are actually doing a little bit of work, punching in and out of um, sort of the not-for-profit world. So, uh, like, do a job for a big data guy in your company and generally these kinds of people, if they're paid enough, they will come in and sort out a whole bunch of really smart stuff really, really quick. Um, the way of starting that conversation though I find is making sure that there's one or two entrepreneurs within the charity that want to be lean about doing stuff. Because a lot of the time you can build something very, very small to validate an idea such as, um, I don't know, can a certain part of the service that we give to beneficiaries be more efficient if we put it online or if we get rid of paper or whatever it is. And you can generally do a change within the organization that seems to be really, really teeny tiny, but build, measure, learn and turn it around ultra, ultra quick, expose that stuff to the powers that be and they actually start to realize that if you put more and more money into that little engine, it spins up and takes care of itself. Um, uh, with some charities, this means um, investing a little bit of money in a little tiny social enterprise fund. Uh, enough so that it doesn't trigger the risk alarm bells um, for the, some of the donors that are giving restricted funds or something ugly like that, but uh, just, just big enough that you can prove that the concept actually works, and that's being lean, if that answers the question at all. Anything else? Questions? Yes, please. Community organisations um, and the like rely so strongly on the narrative, and I guess you could call it the human side of things, that being data-driven can seem kind of counterproductive. Is that the... Now we're approaching. Um, let me let me tell you a little bit about Headspace. Um, does everyone know what Headspace is? Yeah, um, they're like a they're a big sort of um, uh, youth oriented mental health etc. Um, mob, and they've got these drop-in centres all around Australia. I think they've got 90, 100 of them by now. Um, and they decided that they wanted to be more data-driven. And so uh, it started, in a very lean sense, with just taking some of the paper forms that kids would fill in when they went into the waiting room and putting them into a really simple web system. So the data could be collected and, and dealt with. Uh, they sold that internally by it being simply more efficient than having a receptionist deal with a bunch of bits of paper. So if you can actually do something that is an efficiency fix that has data in the back of it, suddenly they can take that to the powers that be and go, hey look, we collected all this data and we've now learned something 
are bigger than what we actually set out to achieve just by doing an efficiency fix. So um, the internet is really, really good at things like uh, geographically disparate stuff, things where there is um, a, a real disconnect between an effect and the cause. It's really good at figuring out feedback. There's a bunch of stuff that the internet is really good at. And if you can find one of those problems within an organization and deal just with that, then it actually in itself creates a bunch of data that you can then use to make the next change and the next change and the next change. So whilst Headspace started with a few iPads in a couple of test centers, like three of them or something like that, doing a little bit of data for the occasional kid, they now have the entire system online, centralized, all um, really, really good anonymous data that can be crunched in a billion different ways. And they're starting to get uh, these magical things that you see coming out the other side where they can, we can put all the data together and show like a little health needle for every single center. Um, we can show the financial health, the, the operational health, uh, the dollar per child through the door kind of figures that, that can become re just really good metrics for everybody in the organization to make decisions. Um, the other thing that is really powerful when trying to do that within a, co uh, a company or a charity that's not, that isn't excited about being data driven is making sure that there's a really good feedback loop. So for instance, anytime you're asking somebody to give some data and analyze it or do something with whatever sense, if you can crunch that data and express it back in a really meaningful way that lets them make decisions, it's incredibly empowering. And it's the kind of thing that turns a, a slog into like a journey that everybody's really excited about. And that kind of energy just flows through the whole organization. Other than some Facebook data, what's the use of collecting a bunch of data around no, not donations? What's the, not what's the use, how do you get to that point? Like um, keep it really simple for the user but right. yet be able to collect enough information to generate this really useful profile. I understand. Um, so funnily enough, generally data collection and, uh, and, and use of data can often come in really, really sneaky ways. And there are online tools, um, I'll give you a list of them later on, um, that help you to measure stuff that you might not instantly realize is actually really useful data. So for instance, um, within an iPhone application, um, we don't just measure how many downloads it gets, we measure how much time people spend on each screen. Um, if they tap the screen at a point that's not a button, that's a piece of data that helps us make some decisions. Um, let's say that we've got Will Dable signing in via Facebook to go and give some money. The time of day that they donate and uh, when they donate and how many seconds it takes to fill out the form is all stuff that you can build into what seems to be a very simplistic uh, interface. So the big guys like Google and Facebook um, run uh, bucket and A-B testing. Does this mean something to everybody? Okay, so bucket and A-B testing. I'll do this real quick. Let's say for instance that I wanted to measure how useful this slide was to everybody. Um, if it were online, I would say, Tim Bosley, he's really clever, he did the internet, buy something. And for half the users that saw the site with his face and the little buy button, I would say, Tim Berners-Lee, he's incredibly excellent, buy our stuff. And then the other 50% of people that would randomly decide which users saw what, would see Tim Berners-Lee is really sexy, buy stuff. And then we can measure with data which language or which image or which uh, change in a user interface drives more conversions or drives more people to go through to a certain goal. So that's kind of A-B testing and bucket testing is where you do this in a large scale. Anyway, the, we find that actually the really interesting data is A, deciding what is a key metric that you really want to measure. For us, it's dollars um, because a lot of the a lot of the charity measurement that's out there with Radiant 6 and all of the social media stuff measures noise and measures hype and all this kind of thing. We decided early on that we wanted to measure young people giving money and we worried just about that. We tried to get as much data as we could about that particular conversation and then extrapolating from there. So um, in the same way that when you go connect via LinkedIn and you uh, just click say hello to somebody, the amount of data that comes from that simplistic interaction because the model is built with the interactions and the key metrics in mind, you can extrapolate all kinds of crazy data from that. And there's actually people, um, there's quite a few really good guys in the valley who concentrate just on getting a very small subset of data and extracting useful information out of it. Um, they're all guys that have like three PhDs in maths and they're freaky, freaky intelligent. But if you give them the right data set, just a couple of thousand points of data, they can extract all kinds of stuff from it. Um, and the thing is that if you've got a really simple interface, more people use it and so you get more points of data on one particular thing. If that answers the question at all. Yeah, uh, I mean, at some point I, I imagine you have to get address and phone number and things like that. No. No? 
No, see, that's the thing, right? We can, um, we can detect roughly where they are um, from uh, geolocation, if we decide to do that. Um, Facebook will give us where people are located. Um, we can ask a few people uh, later down the line if we decide we want to mash the data in a certain way. We can say, hey, you've donated, give us one little bit of piece of data that you haven't, and then extrapolate from there to, for it to become statistically significant. Okay, so maybe there's a follow-up question there then, um, in that for the charity, obviously mm. there's, a, there's a point to get to from today where you're getting the mail. Yes. <laughs> so to a point where they can then follow you up to get you to donate again later on. So um, how do you bridge that gap in terms of allowing the charity to one, get the donation, mm. but two, leverage that person that's made the donation to be able to continue the relationship? Okay, really good question. So the question there is, in a system where the user is quite divorced from the charity they're given to, in fact, we don't actually give any of our charities any of the user data. Um, because our users are sick of getting called and mailed and all this kind of stuff. We're just like, no. In fact, that's a key selling point for our users is that we don't give charities that they give to all of their personal information. Um, that's why we made up fake Joe Clarity. There's no way I'm going to give them my personal details. Uh, it's a privacy thing. Um, so how do you bridge that gap? Um, the short answer is we don't know. The longer answer is we don't know and we don't really care. Because the idea is that if the goal is impact, and we can galvanize a whole bunch of people to give a bunch of money to charities in an unrestricted way, which they can then use that money to go and deliver impact and report on it in any method that they see fit. We can then pull that data back through the system and display it in a way that makes people happy instead of letting the charities make that decision. The charities should worry about delivering brilliant programs to their beneficiaries. The measurement people should worry about measuring whether it works. And we worry about transferring that information back to the people at the other end. Now, this might not work. <laughs> um, but the interesting thing with that is that we, we really don't care. Um, part of the idea with this is that uh, if we can worry just about unrestricted funds in one direction and the right kind of feedback in the other, um, it shouldn't matter that I'm not getting pictures of happy African kids in the mail because I can see every month that my donation is making a change. I can see that me and all of the other friends in Melbourne have all gone and done this and it becomes active user engagement instead of me getting pelted with marketing and trying to hide away from it. And that's, I mean, that's a, a longer strategic goal that we have no idea if we'll actually work or not. Thank you.